Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is such a treat. Um, <clears throat> This is such an enormous pleasure. Thank you for coming out this afternoon to spend some time with me. Um, it is enormously kind of you, and, and actually my son is here, so he gets to see me perform, so if I really screw up, <laughs> don't, um, don't boo too loudly or at least laugh along with me. And, and in order to thank you for your kindness and to, to appreciate it, I'm gonna um, force you to participate in an experiment. Now, we're not gonna do this for another 30 minutes or so, so you got a little bit of time to prepare yourself, but here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna ask you to turn to someone next to you that you don't know, hopefully a stranger, or some, whoever you know least well next to you, and I want you to ask and answer each one question. And the question is, are you ready? When was the last time you cried in front of another person? <laughs> uh, there, there's no cheers. How many of you are like, See this and you're like, oh my gosh, this is gonna be awesome. I cannot wait to talk about when I cried. <laughs> okay, there's two, two people. You guys should find each other afterwards. But the rest of you, I'm sure, are like, what on this? I did not come here to have a therapy session with a stranger. This is the worst idea I've ever heard in my entire life. But what I'm gonna try and do in the next 30 minutes is I'm gonna try and convince you that not only is this a great idea, not only is this something you should look forward to, this is something you should do Every day, you should find strangers and you should ask them this question and then you should answer this question for them. And you'll let me know after we do the experiment if you agree with me. Now the reason that I got kind of interested in this is that a couple of years ago I fall, fell into this bad pattern. I would come home from work after a long day and I would talk to my wife and I would tell her all about my day and how terrible it was. And then she very reasonably would offer me some practical advice. She'd say something like, oh, you know, why don't you just take your boss out to lunch and you guys can get to know each other a little bit better and, and that'll make things easier. And I, instead of being able to hear what she was telling me, I would get even more upset. And I would say, why aren't you supporting me? You're supposed to be outraged on my behalf. And then she would get upset because I was attacking her for giving me good advice. Anyone in this room ever have this pattern in your own relationship? Yeah, okay, everybody does, right? And so I wanted to figure out what's going on. And it wasn't just at, work, at home, it was at work. They had made me a manager at the New York Times where I worked at the time. And I was just terrible at it. I, I was good at like logistics and strategy, but when employees would come to me with problems, I just, I would try and solve whatever was going on or I would tell them what I think they should do and, and they hated it. So I went to these researchers and I asked them, what is going on here? Why am I having such trouble communicating? I'm a professional communicator and they said, well, we're actually living through this golden age of understanding communication. Because of advances in neural imaging and data collection, we know what happens inside people's brains when they're talking for the first time. And one of the big mistakes we make is that we tend to think of a discussion as being just one thing, one conversation. But actually, every single discussion that you have is many conversations. And as we move between these conversations, we can either get lost or we can find each other. And in general, most of the conversations we have, they fall into one of three buckets. There are these conversations that are practical conversations. We're talking about making plans or solving problems together, where we're gonna go on vacation next year, what we should do about Jimmy's grades. These are questions where what we're talking about is, what's this really about? What are we trying to figure out? And then there are emotional conversations. And in these conversations, I might tell you how I'm feeling, and I don't want you to solve my feelings. I want you to empathize. I want you to understand. I want you to ask, how do we feel? What's going on here? And then finally, there's also social conversations, conversations about who are we, where we talk about our social identities and how we relate to each other and how we relate to society and what's important to us in that respect. And what the researchers told me is they said, look, here's the thing. If you are having different kinds of conversations at the same moment, you can't hear each other. This is actually what is technically miscommunication. And that's exactly what was happening with my wife and myself, right? I was coming home and I was having an emotional conversation and she was responding with a practical conversation and both of those are perfectly legitimate conversations. But because we weren't having the same conversation at the same moment, we could not fully hear each other. We could not connect. But when we do have the same kind of conversation at the same time, what occurs is that we begin to think alike. 
I describe an emotion to you and you kind of feel a little bit of it, right? I tell you about an idea that I have and you kind of experience that idea. If we could see inside our brains, as researchers have, what we would see is that our thoughts are becoming more and more similar. Our neural activity is becoming more and more alike. We are becoming what in the language of neurology is known as neurally entrained. What's more, our pupils start dilating at the same rate. We start breathing on the same pattern. If you were measuring the electrical impulses in our skin, you would see them become more and more similar until they're aligned, even if we're separated by a phone call or a Zoom call. Within psychology, this has become known as the matching principle. And what it says is successful communication requires recognizing what kind of conversation is happening and then matching one another. Which raises this question, though, though how do we do that? Right, that sounds kind of hard. Well, in schools, they started teaching teachers a method to do this, that they tell them, okay, look, if a student comes up to you and they have a problem, then you should ask them, do you want to be helped, which is a practical conversation, do you want to be hugged, which is more of an emotional conversation, or do you want to be heard, which is a social conversation? And this tends to work. Students know to say what they're looking for. They can tell the teacher what kind of conversation they want. But this is hard in everyday life, right? Because if you go to work and you're like, oh, I'm wondering, do you want me to help you or hug you? Probably they're gonna call H HR, or things are not gonna go well. <laughs> and so we need to find something different to do as adults. Luckily for us, there is one brilliant solution, one big solution any of us can use, and that is to ask questions. And some questions are particularly powerful. Some questions are magical. And within the psychological literature, these are referred to as deep questions. Now, a deep question is something that asks people about their values or their beliefs or their experiences. And, and that can sound kind of intimidating, right, to tell you you should go ask people deep questions. But it's actually pretty easy once you start looking for it. For instance, if you meet someone, instead of asking them, where do you work, you could ask them, what do you love about your job? Like, what's the best thing about, about going to work each day? Instead of asking someone, where'd you go to high school, right? I, I grew up in Albuquerque, close by. This is the number one question when you bump into someone. Where'd you go to high school? You could ask, what was high school like for you? Like, was it a good time? Was it a bad time? When you look back on it, like, how did it shape who you are now? And those are a little bit more deep than the surface questions, but they're not hard. They're not weird. They're the kinds of questions that invite the other person to tell us something real and meaningful about who they are. Put differently, we can ask a deep question pretty easily by instead of asking about the facts of someone's life, asking how they feel about their life. And there's a guy, Nick Epley, at the University of Chicago who studies deep questions. He sets this goal for himself where once a week he'll go and he'll ride a bus and he'll sit down next to someone he doesn't know, a stranger, and his goal is to get to that person's hopes and dreams within three questions. And I, I asked him how, did this, like, how this goes. And he says, well, you know, like, actually last week I got on the bus and I sat down next to this guy and was carrying his lunch. And I said, hey, what do you do you know, professionally? And he said, oh, I'm an accountant. And I said, oh, did you always want to be an accountant when you were a kid? Was that what, was that what you were dreamed about? Or, or is, there, is this kind of a stopgap for something else that like, you would really love to do? And that's two questions in, and they're talking about hopes and dreams. And it doesn't feel weird, right? That's a pretty normal question to ask someone. It's a question that if you get asked, you love. And some of you are skeptical and saying, there is no way that asking that question feels normal, and so meet your first assignment. This is not the experiment. We're gonna do a little warm up to, to, to get in the habit of this. Here's what you're gonna, I'm gonna ask you to do. It's gonna be real fast. Turn to your neighbor. You can ask them the first questions of freebie. Ask them about anything. Within three questions, your job is to get to dreams or experiences. <laughs> okay, we're gonna do one minute per person. Look to the person next to you. Introduce yourself. Hello, my name is. Okay, take it away. You do a big show, ready? Shh. Well done, well done, all of you. All of you had great kindergarten teachers. So, so th this is the first time I've ever given this speech. And like last night as I was practicing it, I was thinking to myself, what if I say turn to your neighbor and like literally nobody talks, like nothing happens. So thank you for at least putting that nightmare to rest.
Okay, let me ask. How did that feel? Was that fun? Yeah, yeah, raise your hand if you had the worst time of your life that was just absolutely god awful. <laughs> now raise your hand if it was okay, like you really enjoyed it, you got, to, you got to talk to someone. Okay, so it felt good, right? And there's this interesting question, why did that feel good? Like what was it about having a conversation where I didn't even give you that many instructions, I just said like get to hopes and dreams, and it took me about a minute to shut everyone up. Well, here's what the research tells us about why it felt good. The first thing is, you have to recognize that our brains have evolved to be good at communication. Communication is Homo sapiens superpower. It is why our species has succeeded so well while other species hasn't. It's how we have built villages and families and then towns and then countries and cities. Our ability to, to have conversations is at the core of what makes us special and human. And our brains have evolved to love communication, to love conversation, to crave connecting with other people. And the reason why I think that conversation was a good one, and you can tell me if you think you're, I'm wrong, is I think because it allowed you to be vulnerable. Now this word vulnerability, it's kind of a weird world. People don't necessarily know exactly what it means. Because when we say vulnerable, that you should be vulnerable or it allows you to be vulnerable, you say to yourself, I didn't cry, I didn't reveal any huge personal secrets. What vulnerability is, is vulnerability is the feeling that we get when we expose something about ourselves that someone else could judge. We might not care about their judgment, they might not judge us at all, but if I tell you I really love Star Trek and I think Star Wars is the worst, I'm exposing myself a little bit to your judgment, bring it on, to, to, your, judge, to your judgment, and as a result, if you respond with reciprocal vulnerability. If you tell me something about yourself, we'll feel closer to each other. And this is incredibly powerful. Knowing how to do this, knowing how to recognize different kinds of conversations, and knowing how to reciprocate is incredibly valuable. And to explain why, I want to tell you a story about this guy, Dr. Bafar Adai. Dr. Adai is a, pros is a cancer surgeon in New York City. And his specialty is that he removes prostate tumors, so the small tumors that start growing on prostates that are cancerous. He can go in and he can remove them. Every single day, patients walk into Dr. Dai's office having just learned that they have cancer, and he has a conversation with them. And in this conversation, he inevitably says some version of the same thing. He says, look, I know it's, you know, it's scary to hear that you have cancer, but I just want you to know, the thing about prostate tumors is they grow very, very slowly. In fact, we have a saying in medicine that among older patients, you're much more likely to die of old age or getting hit by a bus before your prostate tumor kills you. And, and the surest way to make sure that that prostate tumor does not spread or grow is to go in and to cut it out. And that's what I do, I'm a surgeon. But here's the thing. The prostate is located really closely to all these nerves that control urination and sexual function. And for some percentage of patients, there are these long-term, lifelong consequences of incontinence or sexual dysfunction. And, and you have 20 or 30 years of life in front of you. I, I'm gonna recommend this. I'm gonna recommend this thing called active surveillance, which is every six months we're gonna take some blood and we're gonna do a PSA test. And every two years we're gonna biopsy the tumor. And if it starts like it looks like it's getting bigger or changing, we're gonna put you in, in an MRI. And if it looks like we need to, we'll go in and do surgery. But otherwise, I don't think we should do anything. I don't think you should do radiation. I don't think you should have surgery. I don't think you should take weird barrier routes. I just think you should let us watch and wait and see. He tells this to, to the patients who come in. And they go home. And they usually discuss it with their spouse. And then they usually come in the next morning or the day after. And they tell him, I absolutely want you to cut me open and remove that tumor as fast as humanly possible, right? Just put me under your knife, I don't care what you say, I want to have the surgery over and over and over again. He would give this advice, don't have the surgery. He told me he thought these would be the easiest conversations of his life, telling people that they don't have to have surgery. And every single time, it wasn't even like they were disagreeing with him, it's like they couldn't even hear him. Like they hadn't even processed what he had said. And he told me that when this happens again and again and again, you start to realize, this isn't a problem with my patients. This is a problem with me. 
So Dr. Adai, he goes to Harvard Business School, and he finds some negotiation experts there, and he asks them, what's going on here? How can I have this conversation better? And what they tell him is, look, the big mistake you're making is that you're starting this conversation all wrong. You are assuming you know what the patient wants. You are assuming that they want medical advice, but you are not asking them any questions. Most particularly, you're not asking them any deep questions about what they're actually looking for, what they need from this conversation, what kind of conversation they're desperate to have. Dr. Dye listens to this. Two weeks later, 65-year-old patient comes in. Man enters his office, and Dr. Dye, instead of going into his usual you know, dog and pony show and showing all the charts about active surveillance, what he does instead is he starts with this one very generic, deep question. He says, what does this cancer diagnosis mean to you? And the man starts talking, and he talks about how as soon as he heard he had cancer, the first thing he thought of was his own father, because his father had died when he was 17 years old. And it had just devastated him. And more importantly, it had devastated his mom. And he never wants to do that to his wife. And then he starts talking about how the thing he's most worried about is that at work, he's got another 20 years of work in front of him, hopefully. If the people at work learn that he's sick, then all those young kids, they're just going to think of him as the old guy, the guy who's about to die. And he doesn't want anyone to know. This is terrifying to him. And then he starts talking about his grandchildren and what with like climate change and all and the world that they're confronting and it's all falling apart and there's an election. The guy talks for 10 minutes straight. Never once does he mention cancer. And Dr. Dai is flabbergasted. He expected this guy to ask questions about mortality, about, about pain, about options. Cancer never came up. The patient wanted to have an emotional conversation. He wanted to talk about how he felt rather than a practical conversation about what this means going forward. He wanted to be hugged. And so that's exactly what Dr. Adai did. He did not actually hug the man, but he started telling him about when his own father had gotten sick and how everything that the man is experiencing, his own father went through as well. But also there was these silver linings that they were suddenly able to have these conversations they had never had before and talk about how much they loved each other and, and Dr. Dye, in some ways, feels lucky that this has entered his life. And they talk about that for five minutes. They share with each other an emotional conversation about how they feel. And there's a lesson here, and it's a big lesson, which is that asking deep questions invites others to tell us what they want from a conversation. They tell us if they want practical or emotional or social conversation, if we've trained ourselves to look for it and to listen for it. These deep questions are how we open up a dialogue so that people can say, here I am. This is what I really want to share with you. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to hit the button. But then what, right? So we've, we've asked a deep question. We've had this back and forth. Well, that's not enough to really make a connection. Then we need to show people that we want to connect with them. And to tell you about what we know about how this happens, I want to tell you a story about NASA. Because when it comes to communication and touchy-feely, NASA always comes up, I'm sure, top of mind for all of you. <laughs> so um, everyone familiar with NASA, large agency in the United States? In the early 1980s, NASA confronted this kind of interesting problem. Uh, President Ronald Reagan came to NASA and he said, look, I want to build an international space station, and I want you to start doing missions that are six to 12 months long. Now, for NASA, this was kind of a problem, because up till now, their longest missions had been about 10 days. And now, suddenly, they have to start putting astronauts into space for six months or 12 months, and they realize, if we're going to do this, we need to start choosing slightly different astronauts. We need to start choosing astronauts that we can put into a tin can, throw up into space, surrounded by volume, by vacuum, and they're not going to get on each other's nerves so much that they drive each other's crazy. And there had actually been a couple of incidents where crews on board had started fighting with each other, and they had to scrub the mission. Or they had started picking fights with mission control, and everything fell apart. So they said, look, what we really need is we need astronauts who are good at emotional intelligence. We need astronauts who, when we send them up there, they know how to be friends. They know how to hug each other and get along. 
This is what Midjourney gives you if you type in, show me astronauts in love. <laughs> and I think it's a pretty good, it's at least not porny. So, <laughs> they decide, we need to go find astronauts who have emotional intelligence. The problem is that this is actually harder than it sounds. Because the thing is, if you make it to the final rounds of, of an astronaut interview, you look like this. You look amazing. You have practiced every single question you might be asked. You're handsome or beautiful. You have a PhD. You're in great shape. You know what to say. You know how to show that you're humble. You know how to show that you're in touch with your emotions but not beholden to them. This is a photo of Buzz Aldrin. He can dress up like a Stay Puft Marshmallow Man and still look like he could kick all of our asses at once. That is how cool astronauts are. But this was actually a problem for NASA, right? And the problem is that they realized they could not tell the difference between people who are actually emotionally intelligent from those who fake it really, really well. They couldn't figure out what questions to ask in an interview to figure out who's just really good at answering questions. Because you can fake emotional intelligence for a, an hour a day. The thing is, you can't fake it for six months. After three months in space, who is good at emotional intelligence and who is not becomes very, very obvious in very disappointing ways. So they say, look, we got to solve this problem. And in order to solve this problem, they turn to this guy, Terry McGuire, the lead psychiatrist for manned space flight at NASA. Now, you will notice he is in a space, um, space uniform, a space suit. That is not because he ever went into space. It's because at NASA, one day a year, you're allowed to dress up in the costumes and get your picture taken. And Terry McGuire would do it every single year. This was like the best day of his year. We, he, he, there's literally 37 photos of him in a space outfit. So they turned to Terry McGuire. He, Terry McGuire is the guy who has to sign off on every astronaut before they become an astronaut, and every candidate. He does the final interview to make sure that they're psychologically stable. And he starts wondering to himself, how am I going to figure out who is actually emotionally intelligent and who isn't? And he tries all kinds of things. He starts looking at his records. He starts looking at the data. He listens to old recordings of interviews. He goes through, and he just can't figure it out. He knows who ended up washing out once they became an astronaut and who became a cute, great leader, but he can't tell in their interviews the difference, how to distinguish between them. And then he's listening one night to old interviews of, of particularly good astronauts, and he notices something. He notices that they laugh differently than everyone else. So he comes up with this new test. What he does is, at the beginning of an interview, the astronaut is sitting there waiting to be chosen, brought in. <laughs> he brings them into a room. He has them sit down. He leaves the room, and he picks up a stack of papers. And then he walks back into the room, and he spills the papers as if by accident. And then, then he laughs this big, boisterous laugh, like, ha, 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 I'm such a klutz. I cannot believe I did that. And then he notices how the astronaut reacts. Everybody laughs back, right? We know social politeness, that we're supposed to laugh back when someone laughs. But some of the candidates, they laugh like this. <laughs> that's, that's really silly. Let me give you a hand. And some of the candidates, some of the candidates laugh like this. <laughs> oh my gosh, I do the same thing. Let, let, me, let me give you a hand with that. Some of them matched him, and some of them didn't. And the ones who matched him, they proved to him that they were listening. They were showing him that they want to connect. He did this with, he would talk about a sibling who had passed away, and he would notice which candidates would say things like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm, that's really hard. I'm sorry to hear that. And then wait for the next question. And which ones would say, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I know how hard that is. I, uh, I, had my, I have a friend who died, passed away 12 years ago, and I still have dreams about him. Like, what was your sister like? The ones who showed him that they wanted to connect with them, the ones who proved that they were listening, they were the ones who were emotionally intelligent. They were the ones who ended up being the best astronauts. And the big lesson here is that proving we're listening is important because it shows that we want to connect. And that showing we want to connect is often the most important part of actually achieving connection. And the thing is, we can all prove that we're listening all the time. Laughing is a great example of this. 80% of the time, according to studies, 80% of the time when you laugh, it is not in response to anything funny. Nobody has told a joke. 
Nobody is a comedian. Rather, you're in a conversation and somebody says something and you laugh to show them that you want to connect with them, that you like them. And they laugh back, the most natural response, to show you that they want to connect back. Or take, for instance, when people share something with us that's hurting them, something painful. When we comfort them, when we ask a follow-up question, we're inviting them to connect with us. We're showing them that we want to connect. My father passed away seven years ago, and I, I came home from the funeral to New York, where I was living at the time. And I would tell people, oh, last, last week I was at my dad's funeral, which of course is all I was thinking about, right? All I was thinking about was my dad. And every single person would say the same thing. They would say, oh, I'm so sorry. Well, let's talk about the agenda. Let's move on to the next thing. And anyone who's lost a parent knows, I was desperate for someone to say like, tell me about your dad. What was he like? Like, what was it like to be at that funeral and hear people say these beautiful things about him? But they didn't, because it would be awkward. They felt, they felt like it was the wrong thing to say. Maybe they would say the wrong thing. Maybe I would be offended. And yet what we want is we want to know that the other person wants to connect with us, that they want to hear us. And in a conflict, this is particularly important. When we're in a disagreement with someone, when we have differences of opinion, when we're negotiating over something that's important to us, in these, thing, in these moments, it's most important that we prove that we're listening. And there's a really easy technique for doing so. They teach it in Stanford, Harvard Business School, and law schools. It's called looping for understanding, and it has these three steps. Start by asking a question, preferably a deep question if you can. Listen to what the person says, and then step number two, just repeat back what you heard them say in your own words. Right? Show that you've processed it a little bit. Not mimicry, but matching. And then finally, and this is the step we always forget, Ask if you got it right. Ask them for permission to acknowledge that you are listening to them. Studies have shown that if you do this in a tough conversation, in a conflict conversation, not only does the angle, the incidence of conflict go down by 80%, but when I prove to you that I'm listening, you become much more willing to listen to me. This is how we actually overcome conflicts. Not by shouting at each other louder, but by proving that we're listening to each other. Which brings us now to that time of the day when we're gonna do the experiment. Okay, so just to remind you of what your assignment is. You are going to turn to your neighbor. It could be the same person you just talked to, could be someone, the other person, if you want. You are going to ask the question and listen to them answer for two minutes and you can say whatever you want, you can loop for understanding, you can ask follow-up questions. And then after two minutes, you're gonna trade places and the other person is gonna ask you. Okay, before we start, before we start, how many of you are super duper excited? <laughs> Couple hands, it's Austin, thank you, thank you very much. How many of you are like, I did not sign the fuck up for this? <laughs> okay, I will tell you when to switch places, take it away. Okay, so if you don't mind, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to, to wrap up your conversations, bring them to a close, Tell the other person how much you love them. We're gonna go ahead and stop. Anytime you guys feel like, we can just kinda quiet down. Ready? Shh. Well done. Very, very well done. I want you to know, so it took about 30 seconds for everyone to quiet down, which means Kindergartners have outperformed you about three to one, because we've done this experiment a number of times. On the other hand, we've also done this experiment with hedge funders who would not shut the hell up for like 20 minutes. We could not get them to stop talking. We just love talking about when they cried. So you did much better. Okay, so let me ask. So what happened? How was the conversation? Raise your hand if that was a good conversation. That, that seems like every hand. Raise your hand if that conversation went better than you thought it was gonna go. That's also a lot of hands. Raise your hand if that conversation went exactly as well as you thought it was gonna be. Okay, couple of weirdos. Raise your hand, raise your hand if the conversation went way worse than you thought it was gonna be. No hands, no. Okay, so here's the question though. You just had a fun conversation. You had a wonderful conversation. And yet, 
You could have that same conversation every single day, right? You sit on the subways and buses, you get into taxi cabs, you could turn to that person and say like, hey, I'm just wondering, out of curiosity, when's the last time you cried in front of another person? <laughs> you might want to build up to a little bit, you know, you can finesse it, or you could ask any other kind of question. And yet we don't do it. We don't do it again and again and again. Even though we know we will enjoy it, even though we know it'll make us happier, we don't do it. The Surgeon General of the United States has said that being lonely is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And we are all surrounded by anti-nicotine alternatives and not grabbing onto them. Now, when this guy, Nick Apley, that I mentioned at the University of Chicago, he's literally done this experiment thousands of times. And what he's found, and he, what he does is he asks people to take out their phones and do a poll before the experiment begins. Tells them what's gonna happen, about how, how they expect it's gonna go, then they have the conversations, and then they do the same poll afterwards about how it actually went. And what he has found is that overwhelmingly, when he asks people about the experience, they say things like, I feel more connected to the person I was talking to. I feel like they're more caring of me, but I also feel more caring in general. It feels good to feel caring. It feels good to feel kind. I'm so surprised at how they listened so attentively. The number one comment that he gets when people are allowed to just write anything in is something like, this is one of the best conversations from the last month. And yet, it's a conversation that we shy away from. Not only, it's weird on a bus, right? It's weird in a taxi. Sometimes you just want to read your phone and be, uh, be in your own space. But we all go to parties, and you know how weird, awkward it is when you're sitting there and you like meet someone and you're like, hey, where do you work? Oh, do you know Jim? <laughs> but we have this thing. We have this thing that you know is gonna feel wonderful if you can get yourself to do it. And the question is, why? Why does it feel so good? And I think there's three reasons. The first is, it's because you asked a deep question. And not every deep question has to be so probing. A deep question is just something that says to the other person, tell me how you see the world. Tell me how you make sense of life. Tell me who you are. And they're gonna say something real. The second reason why is because you proved that you were listening. You showed people that you were interested. But here's what I'm guessing, and tell me if I'm getting this wrong. My guess is someone asked the other person the question, that person started speaking, and then you asked follow-up questions. Or you said, oh, you know, actually, that's interesting because something similar has happened to me. You found some way to show that you were listening to the other person. And when you did that, you showed that you want to connect. And when someone tells us that they want to connect with us, it feels wonderful. Our brains have evolved to crave that, to make it feel wonderful. But that's not the only reason that this conversation went so well and felt so great. There's a third reason. And to tell you what it is, I want to tell you one more quick story about these two. Arthur and Elaine Aaron. These are two psychologists. They're also husband and wife. Um, in the 1980s, they set a project for themselves to try and figure out if they could come up with a formula to make any two strangers into friends in under an hour. And they went through a bunch of things. So they, they went and they found people who had a lot of things in common and see if having things in common is more likely to make you friends, and it turns out no. They had people play games together and solve puzzles together. Maybe if we, maybe if we have to rely on each other, we'll become friends. Nope. They found people who were, said that they were physically attracted to each other. Maybe that makes them more likely to be friends. Uh-uh, doesn't work. They had people hum together, because maybe weirdly humming would make us into friends. That doesn't work either. It was basically a normal distribution for every single group. There were some people who became friends and some people who didn't, but there was nothing exceptional about it. So then they come up with a completely different approach. They get a whole bunch of people, hundreds of people. They bring them into a room two by two, sit down on a yellow carpet and two chairs, and they hand them a list of 36 questions and say, go back and forth answering and asking these questions. And some of the questions were pretty straightforward. Given the choice of anyone in the world, whom you would you want as a dinner guest? Would you like to be famous in what way? And some of the questions were a little bit harder. Like for instance, tell me about your mother. Or have you ever cried in front of another person? Can you tell me what happened? What they found 
is that people would do this ex exercise, they would have the conversations, and then the errands would escort them outside, and this is pre-internet, and they would say to them, thank you so much, we really appreciate it, we're gonna listen to those tapes really carefully, go ahead and have a nice day. Everyone assumed that the experiment was over, but actually the experiment was just beginning. Because what they would do is seven weeks later, they would call every single person who had been in one of those rooms, and they would ask this one question. Have you, by chance, talked to the person that you had that conversation with ever, you know, in the last seven weeks? And again, they didn't give each other any contact information. This is pre-internet when tracking down other people is kind of hard. You can't stalk them on Facebook. And what people would say were things like, oh yeah, you know, he said his name was Jeff, and I think his last name started with an S. And so I went to the, Yelp, to the white pages, and I called every single Jeff S in the white pages until I found him. Someone else said, yeah, you know, I, I actually like, she told me what sorority she's in, and so like I went and I figured out who she was, and I went to her, and we actually went to a movie together um, those seven weeks ago, and three months later they check in, and they're like, yeah, things are going, we're actually dating each other, and a year later they got married and invited everybody who was in the lab to come to the ceremony. <laughs> Almost 60% of the people who had sat in those rooms tracked down the other person in order to have a beer with them, or go to a movie or a game together, or just to chat and follow up and say how much they enjoyed the conversation. Within psychology, this has become known as the fast friends procedure. You might know it as the 36 questions that lead to love. And it's become famous. It is the way that we take two people, any two strangers, and we know that we can create a sense of closeness between them. But what's really interesting is that they've tried variations on this experiment. And one of them, they have the same 36 questions, they bring two people in, but instead of going back and forth, what they tell them is, okay, one of you go through and answer all 36 questions and the other person listen, and then get hand over the list, and the second person will do all 36 questions. People don't feel close afterwards. This procedure only works if you go back and forth. And the reason why is this thing known as reciprocal authenticity or emotional contagion. There is something in our brains which makes us want to reciprocate vulnerability and emotionality and authenticity when we hear it. And when we see that vulnerability reciprocated, we feel heard and we feel seen. It makes us feel closer to the other person. Study after study actually shows if you just engage in reciprocity, no matter who you are, no matter what you have in common, if you engage in reciprocity in a conversation, the other person will trust you more. They'll like you more. You will become neurally entrained. And it feels wonderful. The reason why I mention all of this is because when we think about these three conversations, what we're really talking about is what parts of our brains are we using when we're speaking to someone else? If I'm having an emotional conversation with you, I'm using the amygdala and the interior structures of my brain. And if I'm having a practical conversation with you, I'm using the prefrontal cortex. And if I'm, using, if I'm having a social conversation, I'm using what's known as the distributed or medial network. These three kinds of conversations are so powerful because they use different parts of our brains. But if I'm using the, the prefrontal cortex and you're using the, your amygdala, it's hard for us to start thinking alike. It's hard for us to feel connected. That's why when I came home and talked to my wife, even though she was giving me good advice, I literally couldn't hear the advice she was giving me. And the reason why I bring this up, and the reason why I wrote the book is, and I don't think anyone here is gonna be shocked to hear this or disagree with me, we are living through a hard time when it comes to conversation. Right, I mean, we have a political election coming up and like, how many of you are like dreading Thanksgiving and Uncle Crazy Gary and his ideas about like, what should be done in schools? It's a tough time to be having conversations right now. And it's even worse because we've gotten bad at it. Not bad, but worse. We used to teach conversation in school. Your parents went to school at a time when there was home ec classes, or maybe they'd call it interpersonal relations, or if they were in California, something even more touchy-feely. But the goal was to teach you, I live in California, the goal was to 
to help people learn how to communicate, to give them chances to practice to communicate. And now, now my 15-year-old is here, whom I love, and he and his brother spend so much more time on a phone than I did, and they have real conversations on those phones. Those aren't, those aren't not meaningful conversations, but they're conversations that I don't know how to train him to have. But what we do know is this, the more that we think about the conversations we're having, the better they become. The more that we pay attention to what's happening, what kind of conversation someone is ha trying to have with us, what they're telling us that they need and they want, the more we'll be able to connect with them. And the more that we show them that we want to connect, that's when we become a super communicator. And it's something all of us can do. It's not relegated to the, the really charismatic or the extroverts. You are all super communicators at one time or another. And you can be super communicators all the time just by deciding that that's what you want to do. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you guys participating. Um, I, I know there's a couple. There's a couple of questions that came up. I probably should have told you you could do the questions. If you need to take off, please feel free to do so. I know that there's a, it's hot. Um, but in the meantime, I'll go ahead and answer two of the questions. Um, the first one here is from Derek. It says, how can super communicators empower, educate others to communicate more effectively and confidently without being didactic or intimidating? So I would say the easiest way to do that is simply to acknowledge at the start of a conversation, this is, like, I'm not so good at conversations. <laughs> Will you have a conversation with me? They've actually done experiments where they've asked people to go up, great con conversationalists, and say at the beginning of a conversation, I want to have a conversation with you, and I'm not really sure how to start it because I don't know anything about you. And it almost always goes well. I'm a, a reporter at the New Yorker magazine, and I will tell you the first question that I ask every single person that I interview, and you might have heard this, and it might have felt special, and now I'm ruining the, the surprise for you. When I call you up and I say, I say, look, I've read all of your papers, and they are so interesting, and I'll be honest, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm smart enough to come up with the right question to ask you. Will you tell me what I should ask you? Like, what should I talk to you about? Because I really want to learn about your work. And the reason I do that is because then they tell me the question that never would have occurred to me. We think of conversation as something where we have to come off as confident and suave, but the truth of the matter is that if somebody is, ha has a hard time having conversations, the more you acknowledge this can be awkward, the easier the conversation is going to go. Okay, let me, let me answer one more. This is from Gustavo. People are more inclined to talk to strangers in South by Southwest. How can we notice if a person is open to an out-of-the-blue conversation in random places? Uh, actually, let me ask you guys. You're walking around all day. How do you figure out who to talk to? Anyone? Yeah. You're creating an app for that. OK. Make eye contact. Make eye contact. Or honestly, you could just go over and be like, Hey, I'm Charles, how you doing? You having a good time? And they'll either be like, hey, I'm Jim, it's really good to meet you, or they'll be like, yeah, it's a good time, bye. <laughs> <laughs> we are very, very well attuned at figuring out when people want to connect with us. One of the biggest problems that people say that they have in conversations is not knowing how to end them, right? This is this thing that comes up, and I'm gonna give you a, like a surefire way to end a conversation really easily, except that I will also point out all of you are in this room, and you just had a conversation, and you were able to end it pretty well. You're much better at ending conversations than you want. But let's say you want something to fall back on. Here's the surefire way. You're at a party. You're talking to someone. You're like, how do I, how do I gracefully conclude this conversation? What you say to them is you say, look, I got to go, like, go be a host, or I got to go get a new drink. But before I do, can I just ask you one more question? Because at that moment, what you're saying is, I have to move away but you are so interesting that I just, I can't, I can't tear myself away just now. Will you give me permission to end this conversation? And inevitably what they will do is they will answer that question in like 10 or 15 seconds.
and then you'll gracefully move away. I'm gonna stick around for a couple of minutes. Please feel free to come up. My email is charles at charlesduhig.com. I read and respond to every single email I get from a reader or a listener or anyone who wants to connect. Thank you all so much. Thank you.